Shana Tova. There is a story that has become part of the lore of the rabbinical school admissions process at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Years ago, when the famous, brilliant Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was still alive, he used to sit on the admissions committee and interview the candidates. You can imagine the anxiety that this caused a young person applying to school. But the committee, forgetting about the awe that a young man, it was all men then, that a young man might be in when seeing Rabbi Heschel, actually decided to have Rabbi Heschel ask the first question. Since he had spent time in Cincinnati, the applicant was from Cincinnati, and they thought, throw a softball, make the first question an easy one. The young man walked in, sat down nervously. Rabbi Heschel turned to the man, introduced himself, and calmly asked, where are you from? Knowing that it was Rabbi Heschel who asked the question, the man began to sweat, where am I from? <laughs> he began to answer not with Cincinnati, but rather a lofty answer about his place in the universe and his spiritual beginnings. <laughs> Listening patiently, Rabbi Heschel softly answered, thank you. I just wanted to let you know that like you, I'm from Cincinnati, <laughs> but I like your answer as well. <laughs> While Rabbi Heschel was just trying to ease the young man's anxiety, what the story tells us is something much deeper. That being able to answer where we are from really can be about who are you? Where does our soul reside? To think about the journey of our soul, we should think about our bodies, and where we have lived as individuals, in community, and part of a people. But to understand who we are, we can begin by thinking about where we have been. Let's start with Abraham. Abraham smashed the idols in his father's store and heard God's command to Lech Lecha, to go forth to a land that God will reveal. Abraham took his family and his servants and his belongings and he began to search for a place where he could be both physically and spiritually at home. Yes, in Ur, he was physically at home, but from the moment he smashed his father's idols, he knew he was only home in his house not his home, and it was time to create his new home. I am not this morning urging you to go and smash your father's idols and to move away, but rather let's begin to imagine, can you search for your soul? Can you make yourself feel more centered? Can you feel more at home? And if there are those proverbial idols that need smashing, this is the time to think about it. How will your journey allow you to live your life this year the way you want to live it? Since the time of Abraham, the Jews have been on a physical journey and a spiritual one as well. Jews have never been in just one place. In our daily prayers, we pray to God to bring us from the four corners of the earth we wrap ourselves tightly in our tzitzit and we kiss our tzitzit in order to remember the value of mitzvot and just how dispersed the Jewish population really is. Following Abraham, we know that Jacob went on a journey and encountered God in a dream. It was only after he woke up that he realized he was in a sacred space. This is an important message to all of us. We need to take signs and act on them. 
Just as Jacob named that spot Beit El, the house of God, as we think about our spiritual residence, we need to find our Beit El. Moses, too, was on a spiritual journey. From Goshen as a baby, to the palace in Egypt, to the wilderness of Midian, to the burning bush, Moses was a seeker. And he knew that when he encountered God at the burning bush, that he was standing on holy ground. And so he even knew to remove his shoes. As the Torah continued and the story of our people evolved, we saw how the Israelites created a temporary sacred space with the tabernacle. Then they continued to the land of Israel. And over the past 2,000 years, Jews have invented and reinvented ways of making their houses their homes. Jews have learned how to imbue places with spirituality, and then more importantly, take that spirituality with them if they had to move quickly. We have found ourselves in all parts of this world. Here in the openness of the United States, we are fortunate that we can live openly and proudly as Jews. But have we taken up that challenge? Have we made sure that our homes are filled with Yiddishkeit so that we know who we truly are. Let's look inside ourselves and see what moves us. Let me ask you, how often do you take a selfie on your phone? There's no way I'm the only one. There's just no way. Not today, I mean in general. You take it, you look at it, you delete it, you take another one till it looks better. See, you're laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> this year, instead of selfies, let's take soul fees. Soul fees. It's time to look inside ourselves, to ask ourselves, what do I need? Rabbi Naomi Levy offers four questions, very Jewish, four questions to think about as you take your own soul fee. Number one, what has my soul been trying to tell me that I have been ignoring? Number two, what activities and experiences nourish my soul that I need to do more of? Number three, what does my soul want to repair that my ego is too stubborn or fearful to repair? And number four, what does my soul want me to reach for? Levy says if we learn to take a soul fee, it may well transform our lives. Taking a soul fee puts us on a journey home. Let's start by challenging ourselves to engage in more ritual or more learning, in more active Jewish living. Let us think about how we eat, how we grieve, how we love, how we pray. We live here in New York City, but we have another home as well. We have the spiritual and physical home of Israel. Until 1948, the notion of returning home was only thought of as a dream. No one imagined that today, 70 years later, Israel would be a modern, vibrant state committed to serving as the Jewish home and home for the Jews. This home, like many, has gone through stages of building and rebuilding, expanding and contracting. But the essence of Israel remains the same. Over the past 70 years, Jews wide, worldwide, and Israelis in particular, have been able to take the items that they have been carrying on their journey and create their house and their home. We direct our prayers towards Israel and we end our seders with next year in Jerusalem. Israel is an extension of our spiritual home. We need to support our people emotionally, financially, and physically. There are congregants amongst us who have served in the Israeli army, who went to school in Israel, and who have lived there. 
They have been our ambassadors, but we must learn about Israel for ourselves, not only to support Israel, but when we are asked the question, where are you from? Part of our answer will be, from Israel. As the psalmist said, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. As we continue to explore the question, where do you spiritually reside? Let me offer you something that doesn't require a mortgage and doesn't require you to move in permanently and barely requires you to travel. I would like our synagogue, our congregation, to be part of your spiritual address. As you look inwards towards your soul, know that your soul has a Jewish place to express itself right here. But at the end of the day, it isn't about the state of Israel or the synagogue or your apartment. It's about you and me, each of us. So we need to ask ourselves, where do I want to be located? Am I grounded in my physical and emotional and spiritual life? How can I get there? It requires us looking inward. It requires us to take more soul fees than we have ever taken before. In Levy's book, she writes, what does the soul want? The book of Ecclesiastes warns that all the labor of man is for his mouth, yet the soul is not fulfilled. We earn a living and we feed our egos and surround ourselves with stuff but we remain hungry because we don't understand what our souls need. The rabbis compare the body's relationship to the soul, to a peasant who marries a princess. The poor peasant tries to impress the princess by bringing her beautiful things, but it doesn't matter. She doesn't want gifts. She wants love. Levy writes, know who you are, don't set your sights too low. Know who you are, not the title that is printed on your stationery. It's not written on your diploma. It's not listed on your resume. It's imprinted on your soul with vision, clarity, and expansiveness. There is a value to knowing who you are. There's a story about a little boy. Once, when I was a little boy, I got lost in the May Company, in the handkerchief department. My mother told me to stay close while she shopped for presents, but I let go of my mother's skirt and I went to look at the raindrops falling. And when I turned around, my mother was gone and I was lost. The sales ladies were very nice, but I didn't know any of them, and I couldn't stop crying. I just wanted to find my mom. The manager was nice too, but I didn't know him. Finally, the manager bent down and asked me, little boy, what is your name? Dan Siegel. My name is Dan Siegel. And then something wonderful happened. I didn't feel like crying anymore. I felt good because I knew my name, and I could say it. I knew my name, and I wasn't frightened. I knew my name, so I wasn't lost. I was somebody because I knew my name. The boy continues, the other day I saw another boy get lost right in our classroom at school. He knew his name all right, and he knew his address, but he was lost like I was lost in the May Company. We were studying about America, and Miss Statler, our teacher, she went around and asked the children about our homes and the countries that our grandparents or great-grandparents had come from. The boy next to me said something about Holland. The girl on the other side said something about Ireland. But when Miss Statler called on David, the boy who was lost, he just sat there. David, you must have something interesting to tell. You're Jewish, right? I looked at David and knew right away 
that he felt how I felt in the May Company. He didn't know what that meant. Ms. Statler went on and called on me. So I started with what the word Jewish means, that it comes from Judah, and that he was one of the sons of Jacob. And then I started to share a little bit about what I learned in synagogue, like getting rid of idols and running free from Egyptians and following the Ten Commandments, and that Sukkot was like Thanksgiving. I probably talked too long, but then I realized that I felt like I did when I said my name in the May Company. I felt good. So now I realize, can a person get lost even if they know their name? Well, maybe there's another name that you call yourself inside. My name is Jewish. That's my name. And you have no idea how good it feels to know your name. You can't be frightened when you know your name. You can't get lost when you know your name. You are somebody when you know your name. How true is this story of the little boy? When we know our name, when we really know who we are, when we feel grounded, we are okay. It doesn't mean we don't have improving to do. We all have to. But we know what it feels like to be secure, to feel at home. But we know that there are times in our lives when we need to reposition ourselves, just like we need to reorient a GPS to make sure we're heading in the right direction. We also need to know that we have the correct stated address in our spiritual insides. Because believe it or not, even God once tried to reach somebody and couldn't find them. It was all the way back in the garden when Adam and Eve were hiding and God called out, Ayeka, where are you? Where are you? Asked by God to Adam and Eve, did God really not know where they were? As Rabbi David won't be taught, we realize that this isn't a question of location. Rather, it's a question of spiritual geography. Adam, understanding the importance of God's questions, answered that he was frightened, so he had been hiding. The question is not only the first question, it's also the eternal question. At each moment in our lives, the question is addressed to us, Ayeka, where are you? Where do you spiritually reside? Where are you morally? What have you done with your life? And what are you doing with it today? Are you proud of your conduct in the garden? The question is a single word, ayeka. The echoes of the question are endless, ayeka. Like in the Heschel story I told earlier, there are sometimes easy answers, Cincinnati, and there are sometimes complex answers. Finding your soul and your spiritual home is not something that can be done overnight. But imagine if we spent this year working together to create the spirituality that we are looking for, to turn our houses into homes, to turn our connection with Israel from abstract to real, to be part of our synagogue, and most importantly, to take a journey of the soul so that next year would we be able to answer, who are we, where are we, what is our true soul fee? Shana Toba.